The year is 477. The Roman Forum, once the center of the civilized world, is now a ruin infested by sheep and goats picking at the grass sprouting between brick and marble. A few people pass by, trying to eke out something resembling normal life amongst the ruins. Around them, crumbling marble facades that witness the rise and fall of a republic, and an empire that dominated the world. They saw schemes and assassinations, stirring speeches and cheering crowds. They saw Scipio, Caesar, Augustus. If these walls could talk, doesn't really cut it. Go there today and you can still get a sense of the power that was once held here. Even 1,500 years of decay and war hasn't been able to strip it of that. But this place wasn't always a ruin filled with tourists. We human beings are a funny bunch. Mixed up bundles of contradictions and spirit. As much angels as we are devils. And history is our story. It's the million little epic tales of which yours is a part. The actions of our ancestors echo in us. The good, the bad, and the in-between. The past may be a different country, and they may do things differently there. But as a country, we've all visited through the same human drama that has been played out millions of times over thousands of years. And if we know where we've been, then maybe we'll be able to see where we're going. This is Renegade Historian, and these are our stories. Hi there, everybody. This is James, the Renegade Historian, back with a whole new season for 2021. And in this series, Paradise Lost, The Decline and Fall of the Western Roman Empire, I'll be telling you all about how one of the greatest civilizations in human history had its decline and eventual collapse. The Eternal City on the banks of the Tiber has always wielded power. For centuries, the people who walked these streets ruled over the whole of the Mediterranean. After the fall of the empire that bore its name, the city became the spiritual capital of Europe, the home of the papacy. Rome captures the imagination. Even today, if you walk the city's well-worn streets, you can feel something that I can't really describe. It's almost mystical, a sort of energy woven between every brick. Today, the modern city moves along under the watchful marble eyes of statues of the people who built it over the centuries, heroes of the pagan past, martyrs of the early church, Christian emperors and popes from Peter to Francis. Though all the otherworldly power that Rome seems to have goes back to the empire that was born here. Sitting here in our air-conditioned homes and apartments with full refrigerators, electricity, and running water on demand, it's difficult to understand just how good life was under the Roman Empire compared to pretty much everywhere else. Put simply, the Romans achieved a quality of life during the Pax Romana or Roman peace, the empire's golden age, that would not be seen again for nearly a millennium. Everyday Romans in cities across the empire had access to running water, toilets, baths, and sanitation. Many owned their own businesses. Romans living in the countryside, poor or rich, usually owned their own farmland and didn't serve a landlord. Those same Roman cities were connected by a massive network of standardized paved roads that made travel, a life-threatening activity anywhere else in the world, as simple and as safe as putting on your sandals and walking out the door. And all those roads led back to the Eternal City itself, Rome. Thanks to its unprecedented levels of sanitation, its marvelous infrastructure and architecture, ranging from the aqueducts to multi-story apartment complexes and the empire's own internal trade network, Rome was the first city in the world to hit one million inhabitants. It achieved that in 133 BC, 
A city of that size would not exist again until London broke one million inhabitants in 1810, nearly 2,000 years later. What's more, if you factor out infant mortality, an average person born in the Roman Empire could expect to live into their 50s. Many hit 60 and even beyond. Some of the wealthiest Romans lived into their 70s and even 80s. Life in the Roman Empire was simply longer and better than just about anywhere else until the early modern age. All that is why the fall of Rome, the loss of that paradise, or what memory and myth turned into a paradise, looms large over Western history. It was one of the most significant events in not just Western history, but human history. One that altered the course of Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa forever. While most people think the end of the empire came in 476 AD at the hands of a Germanic warlord called Odoacer, in truth, the decline of the empire started centuries earlier at the tail end of Rome's Golden Age. This is the story of an empire's fall, how a city of marble was reduced once more to a city of brick, and how the beating heart of the ancient world itself was reduced to an empty ruin. And it all begins on March 17th, 180 AD, when an emperor died. Rome had seen dozens of emperors come and go, but this emperor was something special. He was called Marcus Aurelius, an emperor with the mind of a philosopher, and he led the empire at arguably the peak of Roman civilization. Today, he's remembered for both his philosophical work, a book called Meditations, and for being the last of Rome's good emperors of the Pax Romana, along with Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, and Antoninus Pius. Marcus Aurelius was born in April 121, during the reign of Hadrian. He may have been born in Rome, but his family was of Spanish origin, like Hadrian and Trajan. In fact, a majority of Rome's five good emperors weren't of Italian origin. But in a testament to how effective Romanization had become, all three men were as Roman as they came. Marcus's father died while he was still very young, and he was largely raised by his paternal grandfather and his mother, Domitia Lucilla. His family ensured he was educated by the very best teachers money could afford. Marcus had a gift for oration and rhetoric, but his interests lie in philosophy, particularly Stoicism. The Stoics had been around for a while, since the Greek Golden Age, but Zeno of Sidium and his philosophy of virtue, endurance, and self-control never gathered as many followers as the ideas of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. In some ways, Stoicism was an evolution of the earlier ideas of Diogenes of Sinope, who was a wild dude that towed the line between genius and madness. In other words, Diogenes was a deranged homeless man who urinated, defecated, and masturbated in public, but who also came up with some of the most profound observations on human nature ever spoken. Stoicism was the philosophy that guided Marcus throughout his life, and it was part of why he had a common touch that a Roman ruler had not demonstrated since perhaps Caesar. To him, an emperor was no different from a blacksmith, a farmer, or a soldier. A Stoic's ideal of an emperor was one who was respectful of his subjects and who didn't put himself above the law, as so many Roman emperors had done. Marcus combined his Stoicism with a healthy dose of Epictetus, whose focus was on achieving inner freedom. One of meditation's major focuses is the idea that you really have no control over nature or over the universe as a whole, but you do have control over how you react to it. In other words, happiness is a choice, not a set of circumstances. Marcus was also interested in ideas of manhood and what it meant to be a good man. He often writes about ideals of 
keeping a level head and a rational outlook even in the worst of times, a precursor to stiff upper lip and all that. That said, he was honest with himself and his own shortcomings in the face of his philosophy. He understood that philosophical ideals aren't something anyone can truly attain. They're ideals to be striven for. You can get close, but perfection is impossible. Marcus's predecessor and fellow good emperor, Antoninus Pius, was also a considerable influence on him. Antoninus adopted Marcus as a son and successor, a tradition that went back to Augustus and the earliest Roman emperors. The title of Roman emperor was not always a hereditary one. Often an emperor would adopt a capable man as his son and successor. It usually ensured that a qualified man got the job, not someone lucky enough to just have been born the emperor's kid. Antoninus was a conservative who, unlike many emperors, both prioritized the provinces and was more a civil leader than a military one. Instead of conquest, he focused on defending Rome's borders and building it up from within. He was good at it, too. In the words of a Greek aristocrat from Asia Minor in a speech before Antoninus, the Pax Romana had created such peace and prosperity for so many that the entire earth had been made beautiful like a garden. But, despite the peace at home, there were storm clouds brewing across the Rhine in the wild and untamed forests of Germany. Antoninus Pius, for all he did well, couldn't see them, and it would be Marcus Aurelius that would have to weather that storm. When Antoninus Pius died on March 7th, 161, he wasn't alone in having that blind spot. Few saw past the murky and impenetrable darkness of Germany's forests to what was coming. Marcus Aurelius took the throne as one of the best educated and most well-prepared emperors in Roman history. But he had one glaring weakness. He had no military or governing experience whatsoever. But to his credit, Marcus was humble and knew he needed help. He saw that the empire had become too big and too complex to be ruled by a single man alone. So he chose a co-emperor to help him, a man called Lucius Verus, Antoninus's other adopted son. In ages past, one man had ruled Rome. There were co-emperors, but they were largely short-lived and instituted as the emperor got old enough that he expected to die soon. But within a century of Marcus Aurelius' death, multiple emperors would be the norm. Marcus also may have needed help on account of his health. He would often cough blood and had frequent chest and stomach pains. His doctor, the physician Galen, is likely the reason he stuck around for as long as he did. But, in addition to his physician and co-emperor slash adopted brother Varus, Marcus had a fantastic personal support network. His beloved wife, Anna Galeria Faustina, was an able politician in her own right, and was as much a schemer as Marcus was a straight shooter. She was also Marcus's connection to the imperial family, and therefore his legitimacy. As far as I can tell, they loved each other, but it wasn't the easiest marriage. The two disagreed often, and vicious rumors abounded that Faustina had affairs with numerous men, ranging from other Roman aristocrats to the lowest of the low, gladiators. But Marcus never suspected her of anything. If he had no reason to doubt her faithfulness, then the rumors were in all likelihood just that. What's more, Marcus had something aside from being a well-adjusted, relatively happy Roman emperor that really marked him out. He was a loving, present, and involved father to his 14 children, in particular his young daughter Faustina, who was quite obviously his favorite. We know from meditations that the children he and Faustina lost weighed heavily on him. Unfortunately, even with Roman medicine advanced as it was for the time, losing children before their 10th birthday was a common tragedy, 
as it was in all cultures before the Industrial Revolution. Regardless of anything else, though, Marcus was a popular emperor from the word go. The people loved him. Simple as that. He was straightforward and hardworking, especially by the low standard of politicians. He also made sure to care for the provinces and the disadvantaged. He appointed guardians for orphans and local government officials in the provinces with equal care. Then there was his relationship with the Senate. Emperors and senators were usually at each other's throats, but not Marcus. He expanded the body's powers and deferred to its rulings on occasion. He saw what the Senate was meant to be, and why the division of governmental powers is more often than not a very good idea. So taking all that into account, Marcus Aurelius' greatness really boils down to two important factors. One, unlike most Caesars, I don't think he felt he deserved absolute power. Two, he was a fundamentally good person, position and power aside. Oftentimes, the best leaders are the ones who didn't want power in the first place. I'm sure Marcus would have been happy to spend his days giving philosophy lectures and teaching students, but that was not his lot in life. He saw ruling as his duty, not his opportunity to do whatever the hell he wanted, and you can see that in how he treated the poor when compared to Rome's other government officials in the Senate. The Roman Senate only represented the interests of wealthy Romans, unlike our parliaments and congresses. Well, at least the Roman Senate was honest about it. Still, it was better than it was in most places, which had no electoral bodies representing larger groups in society at all. It didn't help the poor much, though, but nothing ever does. They usually had to hope for an emperor or senator who truly cared about them until they saw their interests represented at all. But Marcus Aurelius was just that. The people already appreciated his candor and devotion to his job, but they loved him because he improved welfare for poor children and kept Rome's grain supply full. He also kept the streets of the capital clean and safe. Finally, he was a thrifty emperor and did his best to rein in state spending. But that wasn't always an option, especially with the military, which was practically a sponge for the Roman budget. And more necessary now than ever, unfortunately. The storm brewing across the Danube, the one that Antoninus had ignored, would soon fall upon an unsuspecting empire. The people living beyond the borders of Rome, both east and west, had always been a problem for the Romans, going back to the days of the Republic. In the west, for every tribe that was conquered and Romanized, there were two more ready to raid the new frontier. Nowhere was this more true than along the Rhine-Danube frontier. These two rivers, the Rhine and the Danube, Western and Central Europe's most prominent, marked the edge of Roman territory. No Roman had ever traveled far beyond them, into the dense forests beyond, teeming with Germanic barbarians and gods know what else. It was unknown, and not to mention filled with pissed-off blonde people, who would prove to be far worse news for the Romans than their age-old enemies the Celts had ever been. To the east was Rome's age-old enemy, and only real geopolitical rival, one which the empire knew well, Persia. Across the Mesopotamian and Caucasus frontiers, emperors in Tessaphon, near modern Baghdad, waited for any hint of weakness to strike at Rome. Many a Persian emperor launched an invasion of Syria and Palestine with the aim of rebuilding the Achaemenid Persian Empire of old. From Marcus Aurelius onward, Roman emperors, both Eastern and Western, would have to deal with this two-front threat. It's part of why the empire was split. One emperor couldn't possibly command two wars on two fronts that far apart where both enemies used radically different tactics on radically different terrain. In Marcus's reign, 
the Persians struck first, sensing Rome's weakness. The empire had not been ruled by a military man for decades, and the eastern frontier had become a soft target. The Persians launched an invasion of Armenia, and installed a new king before pressing on and defeating a Roman general so severely that the man committed suicide out of shame. They moved quickly, and reached Syria before anyone in Rome could react. Marcus sent Verus east with three legions to reinforce the front. Verus, like Marcus, had no military experience at all, but he also wasn't likely to threaten Marcus's position either. So he'd make a good figurehead to keep morale high while the army handled the situation itself. And that strategy worked. Parthian Persia was demolished on the battlefield. The Romans reconquered Armenia and installed their king. Then they pushed deep into Parthian Mesopotamia, burning cities to the ground. The Persians learned the hard way that even though the wolf to their west had aged and gotten a little soft around the edges, it still had teeth. Sharp ones. The Persians accepted defeat and retreated behind the border for 30 years. It was in 164, during the war with Persia, that Marcus gave his daughter Lucilla to Verus in marriage. She was immediately made into an Augusta, meaning empress. Normally, a wife of an emperor or co-emperor had to give birth to get that title. But I think Marcus felt bad for marrying his teenage daughter to a then 33-year-old man. But it would keep the whole family safe if the guy who got the credit for beating back the Persians was in the family. Meanwhile in the west, with three legions absent from the Rhine frontier, the Germanic barbarians across the river saw their opportunity. From 166 to 167, the barbarians raided Rome's provinces along the Rhine. The Germans had been quiet for decades, and more often than not, the Rhine was a peaceful border, with people on both sides of it trading with one another under the watchful eyes of Roman legionaries in their castra, or border forts. However, there was more here than just angry barbarians. The Germans were pushing into Rome because they themselves were being pushed west, by peoples from farther north and east, Slavic tribes and Central Asian nomads, the latter of which has a big part to play in this story. Trust me, the Germans didn't just up and invade the most powerful nation on earth for the hell of it. I mean, they did develop a habit of doing that, just much later in history. And if all that wasn't bad enough, 167 also saw the arrival of another invader, an invisible one, disease. In this case, probably smallpox. The road network that facilitated the growth of the empire now weakened it from within. Roman soldiers returning from the war in the east brought the plague back home with them along the road network. The sickness was soon everywhere in the empire, Egypt, Anatolia, Gaul, Germany, Italy, and Rome itself. The Antonine Plague, as it's called today, did a number on Rome. It got so bad in the capital that Galen left for his native Anatolia. Verus was the most prominent victim of this plague, but he wasn't alone. Thousands, if not tens of thousands of legionaries also died from the plague, which left the legions depleted and stretched thin against an ever-growing number of Germanic attacks. Something had to be done. Marcus had left for the Rhine frontier in 168, but had to return to accompany Verus' body back to Rome. So he wasn't able to fully respond until 169 to the other crisis he was juggling. And while Marcus had no military experience, he was a much faster study than Verus and would learn on the job to be a good commander. But you wouldn't have been able to tell that based on Marcus's first excursion beyond the Rhine, which was a failure of spectacular proportions. Marcus was a green commander leading an army of green troops. 
Even most of the veterans had never seen combat with anything more than a small raiding party. The German army surrounded and completely obliterated the Romans, then broke through the Rhine and raided Italy. It was the first time in 300 years that Italy had been attacked by a foreign army. The physical damage the Germans did was relatively light, but the psychological damage was considerable. Most in the core of the empire had never known anything but peace and prosperity. That was all destroyed in an instant. Then, more Germans broke through the Danube frontier and attacked Greece, going as far south as Athens and even burning the Shrine of the Mysteries. The last time a foreign army had done this much damage to the core of Roman territory, Rome was a republic. The plague had weakened the empire across the board. The legions of the Balkans were just as depleted as their counterparts in Western Europe, but all was far from lost. Tiberius Claudius Pompeianus, Marcus Aurelius' new son-in-law by way of Lucilla, took an army to Italy and successfully drove the Germans out in 171. Meanwhile, Marcus stayed on the Rhine frontier and used that silver tongue of his to play the Germanic tribes against one another. If they would go back to fighting with each other rather than Rome, the legions wouldn't have to hunt them through the forests. This largely worked. Playing the tribesmen against one another had worked for centuries, after all. With just the larger and more troublesome tribes left, Marcus launched a new campaign in 172. And from 172 to 175, he defeated the Germans several times. Perhaps with the help of divine intervention. In one instance, a lightning bolt took out a German siege engine. In another, the army was out of water and near to surrendering when it suddenly started raining. Both were used to great effect as propaganda back home. But in another foreshadowing of what was to come, pagans and Christians argued over whose god or gods were responsible for the seemingly divine providence that had favored Rome. Rome had decidedly won the war at this point, but Marcus would make a very fateful choice in his dealings with the Germans. In the peace deal, he settled some Germanic tribes on depopulated Roman territory. They would provide the empire with soldiers, and the empire would provide them with land and protection for their families. It angered many in Rome itself, not to mention the new neighbors to these barbarians. But at the time, it worked. However, along with many Roman policies the empire enacted as it crumbled, it would later backfire in spectacular fashion. For now, though, the new Germanic troops were stationed in Britain along Hadrian's Wall, while the civilians were settled just across the Rhine and Danube in eastern Gaul and Dacia, modern-day Alsace and Romania. While he was on campaign in Germany, Marcus wrote most of Meditations. In fact, some of the book's chapters reference where he was and who he was fighting when he wrote them. See, On the River Gran Among the Quadi. What's more, Marcus wasn't on the front alone. His empress came with him and they set up their base of operations at Carnuntum, not far from modern Vienna, and Sirmium, just north of modern Sremska Mitrovica, Serbia. Both cities were provincial capitals but were cold and dreary, with basic military-minded architecture. The furthest outposts of Roman civilization. About as far from the opulence of the capital as you could get without being in barbarian territory. Still, Faustina bolstered the morale of Roman troops. In 174, she would receive a new title from her husband, Mater Castrorum, or Mother of the Camp. Faustina was the first Mater Castorum, but she would be far from the last. It encouraged the civilians along with the soldiers, but it also signaled darker days on the horizon. The small, cold, and dark cities on the edge of the empire she now found herself in were a rather apropos metaphor for what was on the horizon for the Romans. Though few could see it now, the darkness had begun to close in. 
Just when it seemed Marcus Aurelius' trouble with the Germans was winding down and that he might be able to go back to Rome and relax for a little bit, a new threat emerged from within the borders of Rome. Avidius Cassius had served with distinction under Lucius Verus in the war with Persia. Since that war, he'd served as a consul and governor in his home province of Egypt. Everything changed when the 45-year-old Avidius was made the military commander of all the eastern provinces. His already large ego, fueled by his successes against Parthia, now expanded to titanic proportions. The man thought he was a direct descendant of Alexander the Great, and in 175, he claimed the throne and launched a revolt. There were many who believed a rumor that the emperor had died, so Avidius had a following. One of his followers may have been Faustina herself. Some sources claim that she wrote to Avidius, saying that if Marcus died, she would support him. Unlike the rumors about cheating, this charge against Faustina may actually have been true. After all, Marcus wasn't getting any healthier, and Faustina had her kids to look out for. But nothing would come of that, or of Avidius' rebellion, anyway. Just three months after starting his revolt, one of his own men killed him. Marcus was in Sirmium gathering an army to fight Avidius when the news reached him. Ever the gentleman, he didn't want to see the severed head of his enemy. But he did order the burning of all of Avidius' personal correspondence, lending some legitimacy to the claims against Faustina. Following that debacle, Marcus went on a tour of the East, to prove that he was indeed alive, and that he had an heir apparent in his son Commodus, and that the empire was strong. But while the imperial family was on tour, tragedy struck. Faustina died while they were stopped in a small village. At 45, she seemed to be in fair health. She had borne 14 children, and while 45 wasn't young for a Roman noble, it wasn't old and decrepit either. Some think that she committed suicide. Some think it was the stress of Avidius' revolt that had done her in. But the only thing for certain was that Marcus was devastated. He loved his wife dearly despite their often troubled relationship. The formerly tiny town became the site of the Empress's cremation, and Marcus decided to make the spot a bit less humble. The name was changed to Faustinopolis, and it was made a Roman colony. It was now one of the highest status cities in the empire. Marcus also had an altar placed in Rome, where every couple married in the city would have to make a sacrifice in her memory. There was also a poor girl's charity founded in her honor. Now, all those make sense as memorials, but Marcus also had a gold statue made of her, which was to be set up in her favorite spot in the Colosseum whenever he was watching the games. I get that he missed her horribly, but that seems kind of weird to me. Still, despite his grief, Marcus had a job to do. His tour of the East continued on. To avoid another Avidius, Marcus prohibited anyone from serving as the governor of his home province. Before returning west, he also visited Athens to rebuild the Shrine of the Mysteries and visit a few of his old professors there. When Marcus returned to Rome, he appointed Commodus as his co-emperor. The 15-year-old boy was young, but like many young Romans, he had grown up fast in this age of war, strife, and disease. The boy would prove to be one of Marcus's worst decisions. The emperor never thought about whether Commodus would make a good successor. Many of his predecessors had overlooked their own sons to pick someone they thought would be a capable successor. In all fairness, he didn't have much time to think about succession. He had a lot on his plate. The chaos of the age had led to a number of escaped slaves. This put Marcus in a tough spot. He wanted to free the slaves, but he also had a lot of angry slave owners demanding he do something. So he somehow found a compromise. Any slave freed by their masters were protected from re-enslavement. Easy enough. And he also committed imperial resources to capturing slaves that had not been freed. But there were also the problems of the Christians and a gladiator shortage. Marcus would fix both 
in one go. The Christians were already an illegal sect and being scapegoated for many of Rome's troubles. So Marcus allowed provincial governors to buy condemned criminals for use in the games because of the gladiator shortage. As a result, accusations against Christians increased. They needed more criminals, after all. Just make more of them. And, well, even after all that, there's no rest for the wicked. Marcus had to return north and deal with the Germans once again. It was here, at the end of his life, in this cold, dreary, and far-flung corner of the empire, that Marcus wrote more of his meditations. The book was never meant to be published. It was his private journal. But after he died, his friends and family collected and published his writings. Those have survived to the modern day as one of the most famous works of Stoic philosophy. But it was on that cold frontier that on March 17th, 180, just shy of his 59th birthday, Marcus Aurelius died. Most likely, it was disease. But regardless of the cause, Rome's golden age died with him. The Germans were battered, but unbroken. Marcus had inflicted enough damage that they would at least be licking their wounds for the next 50 years or so. But for all his talents, he could only delay the inevitable. In the years that followed his death, all the problems that faced him during his reign would compound. The German attacks and Persian wars would get bloodier. The strife between Rome's pagans and its growing Christian minority would worsen. Famine and disease would destroy the prosperity Rome had grown accustomed to, and the bloated, inefficient Roman government and military would both prove completely incapable of solving any of those problems for more than a short while. Their solutions were band-aids on deep wounds. So, even though he ruled Rome in a time of chaos and strife, Roman life continued uninterrupted in most of the empire. As a result, Marcus Aurelius would be remembered as the last emperor of Rome's glory days. As for his successor, let's just say the olive fell very far from the tree. Within 50 years of Marcus's death, the prosperity of his reign would be a distant memory to the Romans, perhaps entirely a myth to those too young to remember. With few exceptions, the remainder of Roman history would be an unending struggle against the slow decline of the empire. But it was a long way down, and the transition from Roman antiquity to medieval Europe would take centuries. And that's about all for me for now. Follow me on Facebook and Twitter for new episodes of Paradise Lost, The Decline and Fall of Western Rome, at the end of every month on SoundCloud, Podbean, and YouTube. For my Podbean and SoundCloud listeners, don't forget to like and subscribe. And for my YouTube listeners, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Renegade Historian, signing off. Have a wonderful day, everyone.